Good morning. I'm Michelle Manat. I am the president of the James Renwick Alliance, and it is a distinct pleasure to have you here joining us at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. The James Renwick Alliance is a national nonprofit organization that celebrates the achievements of American craft artists and fosters education, connoisseurship, and public appreciation of craft art. The JRA is comprised of collectors, artists, educators, students, and arts professionals. In one, in three words, who are passionate about craft. We, the JRA, are an important and longtime donor to the Renwick Gallery, which is part of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, known as SAM, and its collection. Today's symposium is part of a celebration of American craft that we call Spring Craft Weekend. As often happens, this year's Spring Craft Weekend coincides with the Smithsonian Craft Show, which continues through tomorrow at the National Building Museum that's just a few blocks from here. The stars of this weekend for us are the five artists who will receive our Masters of the Medium Award. Our masters come from all over the United States. The Masters of the Medium Award is given biannually to an artist in each of the five craft materials who has influenced their medium, who has demonstrated craftsmanship, and has contributed significantly to the craft field. Members of the James Renwick Alliance have the opportunity to be part of crafting the history of this field by nominating and voting for a master in our Masters of the Medium process. And they are part of also selecting the Distinguished Educators. That is an award we give every alternating year. Since 1997, the JRA has honored 50 Distinguished Educators, 55 Masters of the Medium, and since 2000, the year 2000, our awards have alternated, as I just described, between educators and masters of the medium. This year, 2019, is a masters of the medium year. Next year, 2020, will be a master educator award. Among the masters in our pantheon are some names you may know. Harvey Littleton, Wendell Castle, Joyce Scott, who was just at the craft show on Thursday evening. Silas Kopf, Marilyn De Silva, Albert Paley, June Caneco, Lino Tagliapietra, and Dale Chihuly. Over the next hour and a half, you will hear from the five artists who we are honoring as the masters in each of their respective fields. Brief bios for them are in your program, beginning on page 14. So I'm not going to give you their, their bio individually. You've already read it, I'm going to, to guess. But more about them can be found on our website, which is jra.org. And we invite you as part of today and this weekend celebration, if you take any photos or if you want to add any comments, please do that with our hashtag, JRACraft. Tonight, the celebration continues with a festive cocktail party a live auction of exquisite work, very similar to what you're about to see, and the choice, the opportunity to hang out with our masters. A few tickets are still available for the cocktail party tonight. It runs from 6 to 9 p.m., very close by the Renwick Gallery on F Street. Please see one of our staff who are in the back of the room, or please see me at the end of this event in order to get a ticket and to learn more about tonight. You won't want to miss it. On behalf of the JRA board and our very talented staff, a special thank you to Kevin Hull, the manager of programs here at the Hirshhorn. A special thank you to Donna Rim, the chief development officer of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and to Robin Kennedy, the administrator of the Renwick. My personal thanks to Andrea Jurovic, who is the program chair of today's symposium. To take care of a housekeeping matter, I would like to ask you to please silence your cell phones. Yes, 
you probably haven't done it. So please silence your cell phones. You have 45 seconds. <laughs> to give you a sense of order, after each of the masters speak, there will be a Q&A with you. The whole point of this is for you to interact with them. There are microphones on each aisle, and I would just ask that you line up at the microphone, and we will proceed in order of first, first come, first served with questions. We will get to as many questions as possible, but we do have to relinquish the room at, before noon. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to invite to the stage our first master, Myra Mimlich Gray, the 2019 JRA Master of the Medium in Metal. Myra. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank the Alliance for all the great work they do and the support and advocacy for over the years. Uh, and I'm delighted to also be here in the company of so many masters. I want to um, start this thing. Hang on. <laughs> OK, are we up yet? Not yet. OK. Um, a conversation with mastery has been the underpinning to my work since the onset of my education as a metal smith, going back to the 80s when I was a student in the Philadelphia College of Art, now known as University of the Arts, where I met Michael Hurwitz, <laughs> actually. And, uh, and I'm delighted to have studied with people so dedicated to craft education and preserving the history of craft. But as a student at that time, I was very much on the cusp of postmodernism for craft, and uh, I felt like I was in that generation where questioning was the height of importance, kind of ask, putting a critical perspective on the work that we do. And uh, I, I often asked myself, what is the role of this process, of this discipline, of the objects that are the outcomes of our creative practice? Um, so I thought of myself as a postmodern journeyman. And in a piece like this, Encanters from 1991, um, you know, I endeavored to make the object in the traditional way uh, of a colonial silversmith. And then I bisected that object and turned it into something else. I consider the work a form of portraiture. So the piece is both present as a chalice and represented as an image of a chalice. And um, the goal is that it helps to stimulate an inquiry about the role these objects play. Had to put in a plug for my piece at the Renwick right now. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be in that collection and I hope to have time to visit it this weekend. Um, this series of bisections kind of got closed in on themselves, eventually becoming just encasements where all that was left was a tiny hole and the teapot would be in the box and you had to kind of probe it to discover its veracity. Um, but here you see kind of a conversation between like the, the object itself and a production kind of aesthetic, the um, suggestion of a mold for, for uh, reproducing the object in uh, conversation with the, the, the one of a kind handmade form. Another thing on, on inspection object like this, you can see the silver solder that defines the construction of the piece and it belies the sense of it as a cast object. So I personally really enjoy the authority that I have as a maker to use construction um, as evidence of the thought process in a body of work, um, the reveal and um, the play that is our opportunity as master craftsmen. From the work that I'm showing is not chronological, so just understand that some things are coming and going, but this piece is from 2002, 2003. Um, it's from a series of uh, molten silver. I kind of uh, think, I refer to the, the work as driftware. <laughs> and uh, it's sort of, um, it, it's probably important to note that the piece is made out of metal, the thickness of a dime. So it's not cast at all. Instead, it is silversmithing. Um, and it's 
interesting to try to set the table when this is what the objects look like on that table. Um, but it's sort of a, it's a play on like the state of the field, the state of luxury, the state of um, histories embedded in objects and that these things are always in flux. I mean, it's not necessarily an image of, of melancholy. I mean, the piece seems to be uh, devolving, but it's also evolving. It's kind of like a, an in, image of rebirth. Like when you think of silver's history over time and how it's always melted down and then rekindled into new forms that define any given society. And so this is something that was um, running around my mind during this series. I like to bounce back and forth between like the high silver and, um, and more of like a casual thing that copper provides. And these are pieces that are uh, sketches, kind of. They, are, um, they were happening in tandem with the silver work, so they were preparatory to that. But also um, explorations of play and like a buoyancy. They're more like plaques or trophies in their in the kind of simple um, editing of the, the vocabulary of form. It's not so much um, the trompe l'oeil, you know, quality of like an exacting image of melting. Um, I think th that the other thing about this work is that it was in response to a collection of cop uh, copper craft collectibles that my sister-in-law happened to <laughs> give me. She had a large collection of these that she had um, received and thought, well, you're, you know, here you're a metalsmith, you would appreciate these copper objects. But they're um, all like part of a, a production, you know, um, reality and um, a commercial aspect of, of like tending toward a hobby uh, in the nature of collecting itself. And so I had this set of objects that I was scratching my head about for a long time. And I started to kind of play with their forms and reinterpret them through my own metalsmithing practice. And then ultimately those objects I um, used as an inverted still life. I clustered them together and turned this conglomerate into um, a shelf for the next stuff that you want to put on there. <laughs> This is um, from a series of work that I did uh, exploring the image of the hand wrought. So in some work where I'm kind of creating an image of the total object as like a portrait of, um, you know, of um, society or family or um, heirloom or whatever, in this case, uh, I was thinking of the incidence of the, the mark itself as ideological. And it's kind of like a craft propaganda idea. It's like a, a, uh, a revision of the arts and crafts revision uh, in conversation with the commercial interpretation that still pervades, you know, home goods catalogs and so forth, the industrial hand wrought hammer mark. Um, so this is part of that series called magnification. And the strategy of magnifying is something I return to in my work and you may see it again. So again, this piece is four feet across. It's in the collection at the Mint Museum. Um, it is um, hollow. Again, it's all made out of um, dime thickness of brass. Um, and I just, it's kind of a, a big glutton on the table, you know? It takes up the whole thing. Um, and you can see here that the, uh, the hammered pattern is, is uh, it's like a mirrored image of itself. It's bilaterally symmetrical. So like I intentionally tried to use that to show that it is a literal and also a conceptual construction of that hand wrought surface. I, you know, as the, as the series evolved, it became stripped of its handles and feet and just became like this rhythmic seductive surface. And in that way, it um, is kind of more free-floating and more accessible, perhaps. So people tend to see it as biological, you know, oceanic. Um, and just the idea that an object that I make could kind of hypnotize somebody into a different frame of mind is definitely um, something I enjoy. I also enjoy shooting the work in situ when I can, and this is a shot in a 
house from the 1600s in Kingston, New York, the person house. Um, where I live in Ulster County, New York State, there's a, a wealth of stone houses from um, Dutch colonial and, um, and early British colonial history. And this is among them. The person house is the name of the, the house. This is another in situ shot at the, um, the Huguenot um, Street. This is in New Paltz where I teach at the State University of New York. There's a, a row of um, stone houses from the uh, early settlement of the Huguenots. Um, and I had the opportunity to curate and organize an exhibition in that space with our students and also sneak some of my work around <laughs> and get good shots of it. I just, I mean, this is basically what I strive for is to, you know, how do I preserve this practice and how do I put it in a contemporary context as I'm, you know, I'm an advocate for it and also as a professor, I'm always professing about this and I'm urgently trying to recruit, um, you know, young people to keep doing this. And uh, I'm, I guess I'm kind of stubborn about it. But um, this is a, a piece also in the Driftware series. It looks great with tulips, I must say. Um, in this shot, there's also some melting cup forms sneaking around the table. Sometimes the work has gotten a little overscaled. Um, <laughs> the, it's a very loose piece, like compared to the fine craft of the silversmithing. In this case, it's made out of like roofing copper, 23 gauge, it's very thin. And I was able to use the, the, um, the repoussé and chasing techniques to create an embossment that triangulates the, the strength of the form. It's all hollow and very light, it weighs like less than 10 pounds. It's kind of a riff. I took a silver plated chafing dish and I copper plated it and then I made this thing and it just like took it over. Uh, speaking of in situ, this is a one shot from the Kohler factory. You can see that it's a lot of atmosphere. Um, you're looking at like a 60 ton uh, melt of iron, um, the belly of the beast. And I had the luxury of being at Kohler for um, for a four month residency. And I have also am very delighted to be included in the book that they did. So if you'd like to see my perspective on it, find the book, Innovation and Collaboration. And I, I wrote a little piece for that. Um, I went in two different directions uh, while I was there. I had to go to the comforts of home in one series uh, because it was already plenty uncomfortable there. Um, this is a part of a series of Frying pans, skillets, and pone pans, right? <laughs> and at the same time, I was really interested in like butting heads with the process itself, which actually, foundry work is a dedicated craft. If you don't do it right, it could be fatal. And it's like really interesting how anything that can weigh so much can be, you know, part of that craft vocabulary. But um, while I was there, I was pushing against the limitations of the mold making process. And I made these patterns from cardboard, like um, chipboard. And then I came up with this like green sand and hard sand strategy that was like an innovative mold process to make these irregular forms. And I was interested in the fact that I was able to make forms like one of a kind forms in a production facility. This was actually illegal. We're not supposed to pour brass inside of a steel mold, but I did it and it didn't blow up and we were all happy about that. Um, <laughs> later on, <laughs> like years later, you know, I was in a, a residency at Kunstfach University in, in uh, Stockholm as like a, a, the master opponent to the students there. And um, uh, I didn't have any tools, any tricks up my sleeve. I was led to a white room. Here you go, make what you want. <laughs> and I poured this tin this tin oval, and it sort of just reminded me of my time at Kohler and like kind of just pulling it out of a hat in a way. Um, also how it's like time-based. It's like an analog version of 3D printing, if you kind of like wrap your head around that. All right, I gotta, I'm cruising now. You ready? Because we got to get going. This is, but I'm happy to answer any questions and talk to you more about this over drinks tonight. Um, <laughs> Clove oval. This piece is, you know, like again, I'm trying to like get away from like my known tricks. I'm always trying to create my an uncomfortable circumstance for myself, and uh, I like threw away all the kind of vestiges of the decorative and went back, but to this like 
oval? What if you hit it with an ax twice? You know, could it be a knife stand? Could it be a handle? Is it still a shaker box? The craftsmanship on that piece is very much like burnished by hand, soldered with lead, like all these things. That's what needed to happen for that piece. But then again, this piece needed a little more time than that. This is a 16 inch diameter silver platter and it's based on like a magnification of um, colonial engraving, which when you get right up on it is very awkward. I was interested in how the line work when magnified becomes like unsure of itself. Yet when we think of like the engraved surfaces it seems very fluid, very whatever, but Take a look at it up close, you'll see what I mean. It's a hollow, it was made for an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York where artists were interpreting the collection. Um, then from there, like a lot of free form experimental stuff, this is a tray, copper tray. It's kind of a cross between like a lazy boy lounger and, <laughs> and a TV tray. Uh, this piece is called Something for the Table. I think it would be great for a muse bouche. Here's um, really um, loops. These are based on ripped and cut t-shirt fabric. Then I put myself in the position of, again, like not knowing anything. I am here, I'm up here as the master of the medium, but I don't know anything about enamel. And uh, this is enamel, liquid uh, porcelain enamel, high temperature vitreous enamel, just like your cookware from your camping kit or whatever, um, but on my weird forms. And these are like, like torch welded and fabricated steel hollow, hollow wear with my approach to enameling, which is self-taught and it ain't pretty. But um, I love the idea of like this spontaneity happening through um, such a rigorous process. This piece is called Speckled Dreyfus, a little nod to Henry. These are some pieces that I did recently where it's like, you know, kind of really spoofing. You know, now I realize my work is like a fictionalization of material conditions, right? So this is not thrown ceramics. This is steel strips fabricated and then turned into a thin walled thrown vessel. Very masterful in its throwing technique. Um, this, uh, these is like a slabs and coils. These objects are about, you know, 18, 15 inches-ish. And then finally, um, you know, these are also some, you know, um, experiments. In the case on the left, these are patched vessels. They're made out, the, the, the welding is, you know, incomplete to allow the enamel to peek through and reveal how the thing is made. And it's also repairing it. So it's kind of interesting that the reveal and repair happening in the same, in the same object. And, um, and then on the right is just kind of playing with the end of day, milk pitcher type of vocabulary of the surface. And then kind of making duct tape out of steel. Why not? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Myra. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome now to the stage Michael Sherrill, the 2019 JRA Master of the Medium in Ceramic. Oh, well, I just want to thank uh, the James Renwick Alliance for uh, honoring me with this, and I feel like I'm in an incredible company with my fellow artists, and uh, awesome work, by the way. It was great. Um, let's see here. If I can get to my show. There you go. Casper Frederick. Um, so often, I live in the mountains of North Carolina, and it's had... Uh, it reflects the kind of life I had as a young person where I felt like when I discovered clay in high school, there was this vast opening thing that I could work out the rest of my life and never really discover what was out there. And so for that sense of adventure, this, this photograph is there. This is uh, the mountains where we live and close to Asheville, North Carolina. 
I'm, I'm a guy that um, was drawn to the mountains as a kid. I grew, grew up in North Carolina, born, by the way, in, up in New England, but raised in the South. Um, there's a the little saying, as an acorn is to the oak, so are we. And so um, I really feel like that's uh, how my life has sort of been, is the sense of being a seed and, and coming and unfolding. Here's the little guy here. <laughs> this is supposed to be nostalgic, so we're, we're working on it. <laughs> but this is me. This is a big part of my life is the fact that I'm dyslexic and and that I was a refugee in the art department. I mean, honestly, in my junior high and high school, my father, I'll show you pictures of those guys, but, but I basically could make stuff physically, but language was really tough for me. And these are two, this is the sun and the moon, those two women, my mother and my grandmother, who, who really held me in, in an orbit for my, my life growing up, because I think being a little bit disjointed and being pushed to the back of a classroom can sometimes make people angry and act out. Well, I didn't, because those two women love me too much to do that kind of stuff. My father raced motorcycles, as my brother would love to say, and, but he was an inventor and a, a tool maker. Um, I grew up in this machine shop. My brother Bix, was got an MFA in art, lived in New York City, uh, would go to lunch with Leo Castali, got to, got to kind of be in the art scene in New York and, and eventually passed there. But he was the guy that, through art, through just dropping a pencil on a piece of paper, opened a whole world to me as a young kid. We're about six years difference in age. And my grandfather, he's got to be here because this man is the one who taught me about the natural world. My father was too busy making a living and this man was working in a textile mill at the time, and he took me fishing and, and uh, grew up on a farm. He made whiskey, and he told me that, about that kind of life, and that was always sort of this, this interesting thing. And it's made me into someone who looks out instead of looking in uh, to indoors. I love indoors, but really I like the outdoors more. And then me as a young potter. So I moved to the mountains of North Carolina with nothing, just a couple hundred bucks and some kiln brick and a potter's wheel, and, and luckily had friends that helped me find my way. I was doing salt glaze early on. The salt glaze was just, I didn't know what I was doing. There was nothing written much about Nelson Book of Ceramics and uh, had about a paragraph about this long, long. And not a lot of information, but I had friends uh, people like Cynthia Bringle, Tom Turner, who as a young artist, they kind of would help me a little bit and advise me. These steins here, early salt glaze. Go through this fairly fast. And this, I'm jumping over a lot of work. I mean, I worked in salt for probably about 15 years, along with other things. So I threw pots. I think I was very competent as a thrower. And it really was something that I used to, to further my work. But at the same time, you're, you're getting ready to see where that's going to make a change. So I became a single dad. Uh, and these are my kids at the time. Uh, they're, they're all grown up. And, and one of them's made me a grandfather several times over. And, uh, but New York City. But the, the thing that happened really different, my wife Marjorie, she's, she's spread all over the, the scene here, so I'm embarrassing her. But um, we met at Penland while I was teaching, and she was there, and we, we kind of had this wonderful kind of walking courtship. But her, her coming into my life really, so my difficulties with, I was making stuff, but being able to, to make show deadlines on time and doing all the clerical stuff, that was not my cake. And so Marjorie was an incredible asset to sort of make it. That's when I started coming to Washington, D.C. and doing uh, uh, the Smithsonian Craft Show. Me and a couple of friends, we were getting in on a regular basis, and, um, and that's how we've met a lot of friends here in the audience. So this work was done during that time period when I met Marjorie. I, I was basically teaching people who wanted to make functional work, so I, I did some of this work there. But 
this is uh, the work became more uh, about this sort of archetype of a teapot, and I was fortunate enough to be making this. This is in the Renwick collection, along with a metallic piece that goes with it. But it was a time where teapots had an incredible swelling because of Garth Clark and his book, and then Leslie Farron and her, her book as well. It really was a, um, an underpinning and making a living. I mean, being an entrepreneur as an artist, that's a big part of my life was how do I survive? And, and being able to use your talent as at the edge of your art and still make a living. That was, that was always that little moment. So I don't teach, I don't have a university degree. Uh, I'm, I'm a practicing artist from, a, you know, from the age of 18 or 19 years old. There's me with some bottles inspired by some of the North Carolina uh, uh, Moravian pots that were done, this big old purple stuff. But the White House bottles, that was, uh, you know, one of my favorite stories is the fact that I had shown at a, sh uh, a show with this work and had great success at this show and took this new work and I didn't sell one piece, <laughs> not one piece. And then I came to Baltimore, the economy had done a uh, downturn and I was at Baltimore and Michael Monroe walks by and Michael says, Michael, I've got something going on, I'd like those bottles for that. And that's the White House collection right there. <laughs> and so it, it was a real important moment for me because it taught me that my, it's not that my um, work was wrong, but sometimes I had to realize that my audience was not necessarily where I lived and it was broader than that. Um, this is, um, you know, I was informed a little bit by this work, for instance, by Shaker. Uh, spindles. These are thrown in altered pieces. They're quite large, just to give you a sense of scale. What is and what isn't tea? My wife Marjorie is the gilder, so. So this, this big door here is uh, my new studio. So I, I worked for a long time in a house I built in studio, and um, about 22 years ago, we built this big studio. And so the natural world really came inside the door. This is, this is a great connection to the Smithsonian. When I was 18 or 19, I came to see at the East Wing of the National, the big cutout show of Matisse's. And I left there with this impression of chewing the cud. I was, why, why was that interesting? And, and it's been an echo in my life uh, for a long time, just a connection. And then Florida Lee, so this, this taking the same kind of throwing, altering, making stuff, and this work is non-functional totally. It's just a piece of sculpture. But I, I made this, and this is the watershed because I turned around and I made this out of porcelain back into high temperature again. And it's using sort of this abraded surface where I'm working through material and putting layers of color and working back through. Uh, a lot of this work is sandblasted and then polished, so I'm borrowing from the glass people here, there's a little bit of co-working kind of mentality that came into the work. Cronona Spinora, thanks to, and Bumbleberry. These are all long, built on a spine. So early rhododendron, and this is a piece that the Smithsonian uh, was up at the Smithsonian's traveling in the, my current uh, retrospective. And this gives you a sense of the material itself, about how I'm carving back in, fabricating. And a lot of stuff is, at this point, is, is forged and added to, fabricated. Fabricating means working out of uh, stock material, which is the way I do it. But this is porcelain and, at this point, iron. So a big part of our life was moving down to uh, Ott and Elma, who were our next door neighbors. They've since passed. But but there's, uh, there's Elma, this is my son Micah, who's a painter, and, uh, he did a portrait of her. And, and she connected me with all the common names of the plants around us, this is called Elma's Weed. And uh, this was Elma to a T, I mean she was colorful, wonderful. She was my second mother in many ways. And, and Oscar, uh, they both did subsistence farming, 
and Oscar Avery here, and he kept apples, and he pruned them so lovely and beautiful. And after he, his failing health and then his death, all the apple trees are dying for the lack of his love and his care, which is a powerful moment for me. A lot of my work ties into that idea of, of things that happen. Toolmaker, and I started a company on the side called Mud Tools, and uh, that's been good for our family. It's leveled out my life and my income and allowed me to spend more time making more serious work. I've done some large projects. This is uh, one that I did for Bank of America. Uh, that's Hoss Haley on the top, by the way, if you all know Hoss. And there's finished piece. Uh, this piece is uh, in the Temple of Cool Beauty, bronze, uh, plain work glass, and porcelain. And we are, I'll just go through these a little fast. And Kohler. <laughs> I'm down to my one minute. I'm shaking some uh, enamel on objects. And here are some of the objects I did while at Kohler. Little flower bloom forms. Piece called Flourish, Jules Vernium, a large piece I did for a project in, in Charlotte. And we're just about there working in colored clay, and I'm working sort of like in a Marini style. And so that's how I'm achieving some of this, but I'm cutting things linearly down the clay uh, strata, and it just reveals this incredible depth of color. Uh, this uh, is a uh, kind floors piece. <laughs> it's called uh, Black Medicine. And then we're closing in on the very end. This is uh, Dutch Solomon. And this piece is called Remnant, and it's about this broken or tragedy. And the very last piece is called uh, A Beautiful Death. And this is, I just finished this at Star. If you don't know about Star, it's in North Carolina. Uh, every year they do fire fest. So this is about a seven foot tall piece that they fire and then open the kiln and we're pumping sawdust into it. That's what we're doing. So I'm a 64 year old man having the time of my life like I was 12. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Michael Hurwitz, the 2019 James Renwick Alliance Master of the Medium in Wood. Thank you. I'm, I'm reminded of a, um, a quote from a, a tap dancer that followed the tap dancer that I was studying with about 30 years ago. He was an old master. The next guy that got up said, I wouldn't give that spot to a leopard. <laughs> but, he, but he had to go on anyway. Um, a few, few years ago, um, I did a presentation where I tried to kind of block out major influences in the work. So um, it's not chronological, but instead uh, there are three, three groups of inspiration. Um, first one is materials, and um, I've got a lot of slides to go through, so I'm, I'm going to move fast, but this, um, this was at the sawmill in Japan about 22 years ago. I bought, through auction, I bought some lumber there. I'm at the mill now sawing it up, and um, I'm just 
just recently sort of split that log apart in my studio and spread it around to kind of panel the walls, and I, th I think it's time to use it up now. It's been, it's been too precious to use it, um, but I think the time has come to start using it. Here I am marking where I want the, where I want the saw to cut through. Um, you can see that's, a, that's the crotch, the image on the right. There's a lot of very active kind of turmoil in the grain in that section of the wood, so I was cutting to, to highlight that feature. That, and that wood is called Zelkova, member of the elm family. Um, the bird cage, that all started by just a walk in the woods, and I found that branch with that, um, that curve and that taper and I knew that I wanted to make something from it. Um, and it was a few years of sort of tripping over it in the studio before, um, before it became this birdcage. It's about 18 feet long. And I, I wanted the, um, the birds to be an important part of the composition, so I'd, I'd kind of imagined it as larger peach-faced lovebirds on the left and, and more finches on the right. This also started with these triangular shaped uh, Zelkopa boards that I was lucky to come across. On oh, Damascus steel, um, kind of a combination lock and handle. Sorry, I'm going to set. Again, Zelkova. The, the material is um, Indian raw silk that's been saturated with epoxy and sanded. It's basically a it's indestructible surface. I mean, you can spill a hot rum toddy on there and it won't. This might show up again in the, in the, in the last group of work where I talk about the, the ideas behind it, but um, the the materials were important as well. This, it's sitting on a um, petrified wood. There's a, a bronze ballast in the middle, just a very heavy weight. Um, the woven basket is lined with papyrus paper. And, um, and the papyrus paper is covered with a varnish that's made from cashew oil. And that started with ruminations, or the, the story I heard as a kid of Moses being left in the, in the bulrushes. Sandblasted bird's eye maple. Um, marble mosaic. And cherry. Those were our first. We, we, being my wife, Mami Kato, and I did a lot of marble mosaic in the early 90s. Um, this, these are two different desks. Uh, one design interpreted through two different materials, one with the marble mosaic top and the other with uh, um, southern yellow pine. Again, the silk, um, marble pad in the middle, cast iron, no, cast bronze. I made the handles first in a kind of a highly figured burl wood, sandblasted those to accentuate the grain and then made patterns from that and had them cast in red bronze. Four colors of um, gold leaf, pink, pink, yellow, white, and silver leaf. The silver leaf oxidizes to that gray black. This is a, a fairly recent piece with mica doors. I love mica because it's a rock you can see through, for one thing, but um, you know, it was a thrill to, to stumble across it as a kid out in the woods. North Carolina was the, the epicenter of the mica mining industry. Now it's moved to India. Oh, this piece, the Philly Museum just bought this. I just finished a piece um, a day ago that uh, was intended to be a, 
the second mica piece. Um, but when it came time to put the mica in the doors, it was the wrong solution. Um, it was just, um, it competed too much with the rest of the activity in it, and uh, I had to come up with a plan B. Um, so now I've got, I've got a ton of mica for, you know, another project later. <laughs> The second group, this is structure as design. Um, and I was the first year of college at BU in 75 um, program in artisanry. My teacher, Jerry Osgood, um, gave the assignment to build a chair that was 6% over the breaking point. And then he walked away and we tried to figure out what that meant. <laughs> and um, he wasn't very talkative. And, um, <laughs> But we decided what it meant was that you can't just like carve a lump of wood and put a cushion on it and call it a chair. That yes, that would, that would work, but it's not optimizing the opportunity to have the structure inform the design. So this was my freshman response to that. And then it, it has, kind of, in retrospect, I realize it's become a really important directive for me that continues. I like that. I like that challenge and the, and the boundaries of um, using the actual structure to help define the form. They're sort of celebrating the joinery. This is a, a holdover from Peter Moos, uh, an important Danish modern furniture maker that um, my teacher Jerry Osgood studied with. But that was kind of a visual language that um, ran through the DNA there. It's sort of obvious where the forms come from and then how they're reinterpreted. Actually, that, the, the twig piece was going to be a treehouse at Penland. I had a big, a big idea, which didn't include knowing how to make one. <laughs> so it, it became a, a table. And actually, a table that almost killed me because I, I ran out of twigs at Penland. I came home and a couple months later um, went to the park to collect some twigs to, to finish it. I put them in my kitchen oven to um, kiln dry them. And it turned out, and I remember reaching my head in there and snapping to hear if they were dry yet. It turned out it was poison sumac. And, uh, so I met my new doctor for the first time. At, uh, These are marble mosaic that mommy did as well, seven roses. These came back into my possession lately. I've, I guess I've lived long enough to buy my own stuff at auction. You know. <laughs> These plant stands sit about this 40 inches or so. And um, this, I think, I've, I think I found the limit of um, that exploring the, the weight to the strength to weight ratio, um, making it as absolutely as lightweight as is possible um, without sacrificing strength. This, that's a chair like it, the rocking chaise is in the runway. And this is another version of the, this one has little blue flowers, um, unlike the pink ones. This is the mate to the Grainer uh, desk that I saw last night at the Grainer's home. I think, I, I think they're here. That was a commission for my sister, and I, I said, what, what do you want? She said, well, something with lots of little drawers in it. So. And this, um, she actually, was a little bigger than that. She was, she's, I'm sure she was seven feet tall. Um, I used to give an assignment to um, build, to my students to build the largest table that they could that would support their own weight um, from exactly, or no more than six board feet of lumber. The other, um, these would be projects that, um, 
may have started with sort of a poetic notion or some other um, idea that I just wanted to give a physical presence as a piece of furniture. These are shots of a residency I did in the Dominican Republic in 85. And um, this was the kind of a pivotal piece for me that I did there. Um, it's where, when and where I realized that I was interested in making a kind of a portrait of a time and a place and incorporated everything that I knew about that place. Um, shipwrecks, Spanish dominion over the natives, um, flora and fauna. That piece came from this visiting the uh, Kiyomizu temple in Kyoto. The tradition of erratic weaving. I, I wanted to make a, I wanted to make a, a nest the way a bird makes with, without all that saliva. <laughs> the idea of decay um, generating life was the piece on the right. This is too much to talk about, but it's sort of the same idea. Um, I tried again every couple of years. I think I got it right in the last, last one. Oh, sorry. That, well, this is one of the things that fed into it is um, what we place our faith in. Um, this is a guy about to go over Niagara Falls in the barrel. And again, that I could have sent this out and had it professionally polished, and you know it would have taken an hour. But I prefer to do it the old-fashioned American way by exploiting cheap immigrant labor. <laughs> my my smiling wife, mommy. Finally, this is. Um, Pine needle forest. Um, that's a, a, a lacquer, Japanese lacquer um, collaboration I did. Um, the form is based, the surface actually comes from literally dropping pine needles on the wet lacquer. The form came from the, the idea of this polished surface in a stone. I love the idea of preparing your mind to make the work of art by this process of making the ink. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Would you please now help me welcome to the stage Nancy Crow the 2019 James Renwick Alliance Master of the Medium in Fiber. Thank you. I'm going to give you a description of who I am first. Can you hear me OK? I'm an artist. I am 75 years old. <laughs> I'm the youngest of eight, strongly opinionated, <laughs> scrappy, determined, focused, hardworking, driven, a perfectionist, but oh boy, a daydreamer. <laughs> obsessive, obsessive, obsessive. Used to failure, a tough teacher. I hate being short. <laughs> I wear a uniform, so I am not getting dressed up for tonight. I love solitude. My medium is quilt making. I love machine piecing. I love the engineering of parts to parts. I am a colorist. I love fabric. I love dyeing it. I love cutting it up. 
I work improvisationally. I freehand cut all elements. I believe I draw, am drawing, when I swing my arm using my rotary cutter. I think of my work as drawings. I also create monoprints and screen prints. I'm starting with the year 1979. I'll be honest and tell you that I just could not take the time out of my life to take all my film images of my work and make them digital. So, da-da, you see one. <laughs> 1979 was a pivotal year for me because I had struggled from 1974 to 1979 how do I make quilts that are my own, that are in my own voice? And I started out by, of course, reading books. At that time, there weren't very many, looking at old traditional patterns, trying to put them into my voice. Well, in 1979, Paul Smith lo loved this piece, and he put it in the front window of the American Craft Museum in New York City, and my career took off. 1979 was also the year we moved to a farm. I was 36 years old, was so wanting to move to a farm, thinking it was the most romantic thing that you could think of. And then reality sat in when, set in when I realized, oh my gosh, I don't have any friends anymore. They're not here. I have to learn to live with nature. I have to learn to live back this long one-fourth mile lane. But today, 40 years later, I am saying to all of you that once I go up this lane and am closed by those big red oaks I planted on either side, all of a sudden it opens up into my environment. And I love it. This is my first hardback that covered my work from 1972 to 1988. And then uh, the catalog for my show at the American Craft Museum, covering work from 1989 to 1992. My solo show at the Renwick, which then went on to Germany, so the catalog is in both English and German. And then Wow, a change in my life. The year 2000, we basically opened up this wonderful teaching facility on our farm. This is a huge German timber frame barn that belonged to our neighbors who happened to call up one day and say, you want it, get it, because it's coming down. <laughs> so my husband and my two sons, all of whom who are here in the audience, we're at a time in their lives when they could move this barn and rebuild it. It sat on the farm, it, it sat on the ground on big boulders. So we first had to develop an earthen hill and then pour the concrete walls so the barn could be put up on top of the walls. So for this teaching facility, I could have wet rooms downstairs and dry room upstairs. I had been a freelance teacher for 20 years, and let me tell you, it's not fun. <laughs> but quilt making could not be part of college and university art departments, because I was told in graduate school, applique, stitching, quilt making, stupid, not intelligent enough. So off I went on a freelance career trying to earn income to, to buy things for my own studio work, and now I have my own teaching facility that I can have it the way I want it, which means big walls for students to work on, ergonomic chairs, great lighting, natural lighting. And then, because I now have my own teaching facility on my farm, and now today we're being slammed, we can't even take all the people who want to come and uh, learn there, over these last 20 years, I've been able to develop what I would call a, an in-depth coursework in figure ground, classical figure ground composition, because what I saw in quilt making is that so many quilt makers did not understand it. 
So little by little, I worked and worked, and because same, often the same students would be coming back, I could push them to a much higher level. When I said I was a tough teacher, I'm a tough teacher. So I taught people to draw, to with black fabric, to lay out their compositions on the wall. And then how to go back into color. On uh, May 2014, we start my new big studio. I began saving money when I was 52 years old. Boy, that money I put away for that studio, that money did not get touched. When I hit age 68, I said, this is it. If I don't get this studio built, it is not going to happen. And I had a hard time finding someone who could build a studio for my uh, amount of money that I had saved. And one of the things that we did is we attached it to the end of the existing studios, where, which were other timber frame barns that my husband had moved and uh, renovated, helped renovate with, along with a carpenter. Uh, this is a big addition, 60 feet by 36 feet. So uh, this is what it looks like now. And um, I have the first floor and the second floor. The second floor is for storing work. The bump out is where I work on all my teaching materials. This is my lower space that is 50 feet by 36 feet. You can see it's already maxed out. <laughs> I just I have a hard problem not maxing everything out. You notice I have tons of tables. I have a very good dye studio down in the basement. I've kept very good records over probably around close to 30 years of all my colors that I dye. I think it's important to be in charge of my own colors that I use. Here they are laid out, some of them. Um, you know, unlike a painter, we can't change a color just because we feel like stroking over what we don't like, we have to have the colors already dyed at hand, ready to be cut up. This was uh, the next big hardback covering my work from 1988 to 2005. It was a really, this book to me is just absolutely filled to the max with seed ideas. I, I would say uh, I, I'm a person who, on one hand gets bored, gets impatient, and I realized looking back that I had these wonderful seed ideas that I didn't develop well enough. I didn't take them somewhere. So I'm gonna just show you three pieces from this period. I kind of veered from, uh, I wouldn't say I ever do really spare work uh, but to really complex work. I'm, I love complexity. And of course, I love color. And then moving up into the two, later, later 2007s, I, I will also admit that all this renovation of timber frame barns on our farm, I gotta go a little faster, according to Andrea. <laughs> um, we had lots of boards laying on piles, so these three pieces kind of are about that. I went through a period of wanting to do screen printing, rented a space in Australia with a friend. Those are some of my images that I blew up for screens. needed an assistant to pull these great big prints, a piece from that time. Went on to uh, doing mono printing. These are all things that I was interested in working on. I uh, had a little bit of instruction in mono printing and then became self-taught, working on massively large mono prints on fabric. My dear darling husband was the person who helped pull these. Uh, I would tell you that the imagery is about anxiety. I have lots of anxiety. <laughs> this is major anxiety. <laughs> so this is a wall of uh, some of my over 250 monoprints I've made. Another uh, version of the boards overlapping from the barns. 
And then a monoprint that's done with very, very fine markings in which I had to develop layers and layers of groundwork before I came back in with the big tools and worked on the larger strokes. Last year, I was fortunate to have an exhibition in England of 75 of the prints, and I'm standing in the hall there with uh, Pauline Burbage, who's one of our great quilt makers who lives in Scotland. And then back to um, strip piecing, which is machine piecing, which is cutting lines, cutting strips. This is, again, swinging my arm. I happen to believe that how you swing your arm just like you draw, that is who you are. And um, these are part of, sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> part of a group I'm working on, these are not finished in this picture. But again, just think always about line. I'm working with line. I love line. And then going on to something fairly severe, this is line, and again, the boards, the slats, the shape of the slats. These are all very large pieces, giving you an idea of, let's say, eight feet by eight feet, seven feet by seven feet. This is a little bit about my working method, but not much, because then here's the finished piece before it got quilted. And then ending with um, the parts and pieces I made to do this color studies that I've been working on, one of which will be up for auction tonight. And these will feed into large pieces. And this is what I do when I get anxious. <laughs> I don't drink, I don't take drugs but I sure bake pies. I think she's setting the table for us to be a little bit hungry. So that's going to just encourage our next speaker to adhere to the time. I love a photograph that included an ironing board in the center of it. That touched me. Since I don't do much ironing, it reminds me of my inadequacies. Last, and by no means least, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage a Washington, D.C. native, like me, Thurman Statham. The 2019 James Renwick Alliance Master of the Medium in Glass. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alliance, for all you've done, and, and um, thank you for I mean, the other, the other, the four artists that it's, I'm just overwhelmed with what you do. Um, I, I, this is kind of an emotional um, day for me because I, uh, I used to play hooky in this building as a high schooler. <laughs> and and, um, and the, the, what I do is, I think I went to seven high schools and I got chased out of each one. So what I would do is I'd start at the National Gallery, and then at the time the National, um, the Technology Building, had um, for a dollar and fifty you could get a Coke and a hamburger and fries, and then I'd always end up at the Freer studying ceramics, and a, a curator there by the name of Marty Amped, um, he um, noticed that I was always hiding out there, and he got me involved with making ceramics. And then one day he says, you know, there's some Raku being demonstrated on the mall. And I go out to the mall and, and um, I, I show them the work. I, they want to see my work and I show them the work and they flew me to the School of Design. And I was, that's how I started. That's really how I started. And um, so I have a really emotional connection to institutions, to the Smithsonian. Um, I remember going to the Renwick after one 
notorious day in high school. Notorious, I mean, oh my God, it was unbelievable. I think that was, uh, and I went and I saw a Sam Gilliam show. And I said, that's what I want to do. So, you know, I, I went up to Rhode Island and I, there, there was glass blowing. So I started blowing this, this glass stuff, you know, and, and Dale Jahuli was there. Um, June Kaneko was there. Um, they were just incredible. Norm Schumann was there. You know, and um, you know, I was 17. I didn't really know what to make, you know, and and so I thought, God, uh, what, why, you know, I, at this point, I, I said, well, how do you, how do you learn? What is education? How do you, how do you process? Everyone loved what I did, so I started working with the unknown. So here, I made a volcano. It started a fire on the floor. They were grumpy, but it was my first performance. <laughs> Here we're chopping the glass. And I went, don't you go to school to make mistakes? You know, everyone said it was great. I thought, well, maybe it's because I'm black. Everyone says it's great. I don't know, you know. But these are things that I went through. And then, you know, I'm, and I'll be quick. I don't mean to be too autobiographical. But I remember making these cones one day and Dale coming in and saying, that's a great sculpture. And I was just storing them that way, you know. So I said, fine, you know. I was like, OK. You know, and you have to bear in mind, I, I, couldn't even, I couldn't even draw models because they were naked and I had never seen someone naked. So I would copy off of someone else's paper. It was terrible. You know, so these, and these are things I made, you know, and it was so incredibly exciting. You know, there's an artist, I think you've honored, Tutsinski. I saw her work, I said, can I make your work? I copied her work, I made everything she made for like three months just to learn. It was so much freedom. And I, I love the foster to this current day. And these, the, the, this is like, um, they, they were amazed when I made this thing. And I was like, that was great. And they loved it. And they gave me a year advance standing. And I had a whole drawing book. You know, June Kaneka would say, you should fill the drawing book, the whole book, every day, a new one. So <laughs> in a month, I had 30 books. You know, and so I had a whole bunch of those pieces and they were too easy to make, you know, they looked really good, everyone was sort of happy, you know. Um, so I, um, you know, as I graduated, I got interested in, in the process, the, the process of making things was as important to me and maybe more so and what I learned from them as the objects. And, uh, you know, I get asked to make a show. And so I said, can I make the work at the gallery? And the, the guy would say, yeah. So this is a product of that effort. And he says, well, I says, I want to paint. He says, well, you don't paint, don't you? He says, well, I'm going to find out if I can, you know. <laughs> and, and, and this show was about, you know, you know, the, you know, we brought all these objects in. And then, you know, that this is the looking back in the gallery. He got grumpy. He got really grumpy at me because he couldn't sell things. And I, so he let you, they put these red dots on things, you know? So I had the painting of this guy that was in the in jail. So I put the dots on him and said, that should make you happy. You know, and, and, you know, and at the time, there were about eight artists that came to help me make these things. Um, these are just some of the objects that I would do. And someone, I think someone mentioned Paul Smith. I remember Paul Smith going in the basement of a gallery and pulling out a piece and putting it in a show. And prior to that time, I, I was actually throwing the work out because no one wanted anything with glass that was glued together. No one, you know, and, and it was wonderful. So I did quite a few of these kinds of works and, and I started consolidating them into studio generated works. And, and, you know, I, like I think all of us, to some degree, there's a certain balance between technique and ideas and how you, and how you move through in, in terms of how you learn what to do. It's, it's like I, I learned to draw. This is a recent house. It's about seven feet. You know, I mean, think about this. The other day, I started getting invitations from the um, Black History Museum they built down here. I was like, why did I get the invitation, you know? And then, so I said, let's go to the opening. It's a big opening. And then I have a big house like that in my, I said, oh my God, I'm not even dead, you know? It was really great, you know? And so, I mean, it's, 
You know, this is another installation that was done in Toledo, and there was a lot of different objects um, incorporated into the, into the show, into the piece. They wanted us to reference things, and I kind of overdid it, and there were about 26 references, and then I was gonna toss it, and they said, could you re restructure it and put it in the entrance of the museum? So, you know, I'm sort of a comedy of eras. I, you know, I decided I wanted to paint more formally, and, you know, I got married, and I made this garden, and I started painting the fruit. <laughs> it was really difficult, the marriage, because, uh, because in the garden, you know, it was the metaphor for the marriage, and I didn't put the labels on the food, you know? So it was really hard to grow it, you know? Because you didn't know what was a weed and stuff, but it worked out. But these are some of the paintings. This is about, you know, and, and, and the act, you know, they're, they're very, you know, these are, so, I, so I'm a glass blower, and, and I, I, you know, I love the, there's a language I believe and what we do, you know, I learned, you know, that involves the material in that language. It's almost an instinctive kind of, kind of, 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 um, almost an instinctive kind of intellect that, that carries over with, with craft materials. That's such an instinctive part of me forever, you know, these ladders and, um, so these were substructures that I, you know, I took a almost an instinctive interest in, and as as studio generated objects, which take quite some time. You know, there's blown, there's parts. I I collect parts. I make shards. I go to schools and dig through their trash and mine things. And um, there's a chair. It's quite large, and these are. There's maps and there's structures that are overlapped. I um, was in Africa and I saw this tree with all these bottles and, and, and you know, I've always been interested in ritual and I started making these many kind of rituals out of aluminum and, and glass. I live in Oha Omaha and um, they wanted, I, I, you know, I was in the studio so much, they wanted me to make this, everyone has to make their little Omaha thing they asked me to make, so I said, could I float it? So I did, you know, I could go fishing and stuff. Um, you know, public art is something I get involved with. Um, this is actually a piece in construction, it's in a subway system. The ladder is 16 feet and it was, in, it was covered with uh, the dichroic glass. And everything went wrong that could go wrong, but the piece ended up pretty good, I must admit. It was called, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> they want to, it was called, I can't stand it. I mean, you know, and there were like, there were 12 engineers, you know, and, and it's the first time, I never, I never thought anything that I make should last very long, but they did. So I have to deal with it, you know? This is a, a suka, you know, which is a, Really, Thanksgiving, you know, we, we kind of stole it from the, Ju from the Judaic religion. And every September, they, they, um, there's a, it's a time that the Jewish were, it honors the time the Jewish people were in the desert for, and, and lived in these huts. So they asked me to make this three-sided structure. And, uh, and you know, everyone, it's it sort of, it, every, just about everything in it has a very specific, symbolic concept to Judaism, but you don't, unless you're Jewish, you don't really know it, you know? And um, it worked, it's at the Skirball Museum. So, you know, it was, it was really well received. It's, they own it, they put it out every two or three years. And they, they said, you know, you really understand Judaism, you should be Jewish, you know? And I said, you, you, gotta, you got enough problems, so don't me, <laughs> you know? And this is, see, a bus stop. You know, the, I remember the meetings, they were like, you're gonna, you're gonna like, people were gonna steal the benches, so I made them out of boulders, you know, they couldn't <laughs> lift them. But you see the aluminum and the leaves, um, and, and there were three committees, I remember this, there were the art committee, and then there was the retirement home across the street, that, that was the core committee, and, you know, and me. <laughs> These are some drawings of a study most, most of the projects I address right then and there, but this one, they, it's a chandelier design. 
So there's a, one was nature, one is humanity, and one is spirituality, the themes. And the egg, the bird is 13 feet tall, so it's not small. This thing is really big and, okay, um, you know, and, and you can sort of see the scale of it, huh? This is in, I do a lot of work with the State Department. I used to, I used to travel and do outreach programming and, and I would do a show. This is a show in Germany and uh, we, we grant, it's at a factory that is, is maintained from the 1800s and they asked me to grandfather a show which means make it there. And it was really a tough show because um, the, and then bringing the glass, the company gave us a lot of glass and then we brought the glass and at the company someone got injured and they died. It, they, so we had to dedicate the show to the community and, and it changed all the rules. So anyone could work on this show. The kids came, it was, it was really amazing and we actually changed the village. Um, the kids designed things, I designed things. You know, we had all these discussions and and, you know, I'm talking to these kids, but nobody speaks English. We didn't care, you know, and, and it was a wonderful thing. We developed educational programs, um, but that's, this is one. This is in Mozambique. You know, on this day, we had to use paper plates because they ran out of paper. It was for 35 kids. Over two villages of kids showed up. Everything that could go wrong went wrong, but I died and went to heaven that day, you know. Um, and people started making pigments out of clay and dyes. We, we had shows outside. I, I've been to about, eight. There were, that's just one, the picture's about nine pictures long of kids. You know, there, there was pretty, you know, the war, they had decommissioned all the guns. You know, these are traditional carvers and they want to make a glass house. I was like, what the heck, you know? Uh, this is in Omaha, uh, it's the Talons. It's a Sudanese based refugee. Um, basketball mentorship and um, I work a lot with sort of displaced communities. Um, Makar, he came to visit one day. He was, he's head of a, of a, actually he's, he's head of a guerrilla organization if you want to know the truth and um, of a massive scale and, and we deal with how to create, there's a lot of, I'm an activist. I am actually a full-on activist and I deal with a lot with um, displaced people that have to redefine their homes. This is part of my studio, um, a section, and, and you can sort of see some of the, the construction processes um, here. That's that piece once it's finished. So it's really kind of hard. I'm, I'm sort of a nice guy, but I cuss a lot. I'm really grumpy. Because this work is, you know, this thing, it's, it's big, you know, that, that's a hundred foot wall. So you can imagine what, you know, moving it around and lifting it. That's the, the, this is at the Tampa Museum. And, you know, then that, this is in Denmark at the um, Kans Falk Museum, I think. And, and you know, each, each show there's, uh, my daughter is half Danish, so we, the show was really dedicated to her um, at the Corning Museum. Um, we made a, a sort of an interior park, so at this in this space here. <laughs> um, let's see. This side is, this is at the Orlando Museum of Art, and the show was called Stories of the New World. Um, it was about seven thousand feet. It was just, and there was a lot of mirror, a lot of proje projections, but everything was built in the show around things that happened, and since it was built around. The, the fountain of youth and, and how the world had changed. You know, prior to, prior to that Ponce de Leon and the fountain of youth and all that stuff, things were, things were you know, pretty, the world was pretty flat, you know, and, and they realized it's round. Whoops, excuse me. Um, at, during that time, I met several collectors that were very involved with the Southern Christian leadership and they, they, there was, it's very interesting what, what I discovered. There's quite a few collectors in the glass field that were primary players in the civil rights movement. Um, this is another project at the Nally, at the um, Nanny Helen Burroughs 
organization, and they, they had me work with these, these, I'm always working with communities wherever I go, and usually before I do a show, I'll build out, I'll build out a, um, an educational program a year or two before, and you know, what, what overtones, like in this show here, it's at the Museum of Nebraska Art, and they had no Indians at all in the, in, the, in the collection that were alive anyway. So I got grumpy and I made these movie theaters out of mirror and put racist video, uh, cowboy movies in, you know? And I did, and there's, uh, this is at, I know, a, a sort of a workshop with Native American families that we do where the, the men have to work with the kids. Hmm? Um, and that we did, I had a show, but I put their work up. The gallery was furious, you know. Um, we built this garden, it's a healing garden, and it's at a Montessori-based Native American school, and the kids learn their tradition. It's about partway, it's almost completely done, but this is some of the work. It's terrazzo, and, and um, there's the turtle, we made a turtle, but the kids play, and they instinctively learn their, by playing their, their cultural history. This is a show that we did at the Kaneko of the kids' work, glass blowing, and um, teepees. So I'm always kind of putzing around with with how to, you know, particularly being in Omaha and having that community um, and the challenges of that community. They're refugees on their own land, you know. Um, they, they they wanted documentation, so I told the kids that we set up a photo booth, and they just dressed up and took pictures of themselves. This is in in a mural I did in Pittsburgh. You know, um, at the um, and, and you know it was a big fight. I said, look, I don't want any physical like I don't want pictures of civil rights activists. I just want to engage this community with color. You know. The best part was when I got stuck on that thing and there was a big rainstorm <laughs> and I got washed. It was like being put in a washing machine. That was my favorite part of the whole project. <laughs> you know, it was a big chair. You know, um, kids. I worked with this kid here. He, he got cancer. He just had a chemotherapy treatment and then I, I do a lot of work with pediatric cancer and we formed a team of kids that took over the art projects and made this collaboratively. It was really a great thing, you know, because 11 of the kids I got were diagnosed as being terminal and eight went into remission. We lost a couple later, but we just sort of dealt with, you know, how, how that works, you know, how, what, what, what inspires life, you know, and um, it's, a, it's, a still, it's an ongoing project. Um, that's one of the, these are some of the team leaders. This, this is another project where they asked me to make a artwork that would inspire a community. So I thought, God, I'm not a prophet. What do you want me to do? So I gave, I found the worst school and the worst kids. I don't know what happened to the computer, but maybe I'm tired of time anyway. So, <laughs> you know, you can ask us questions. And um, thank you, thank you very much. Huh? there is light again. I was a little worried. So that was truly emotional and in encyclopedic in 50 minutes. And are your appetites whetted just a little bit, having seen all of this extraordinary work, scrumptious work, to spend some time with the masters this evening? Please, please join us if you haven't bought a ticket already. Come see me or come see any member of the staff. We're hanging out till the last do dog dies here today. So we would be so happy to welcome you tonight and you can come however you wish. By no means are we black tie. So I have a whole bunch of questions, but in the interest of time, I am going to hold those for another moment. And I'm going to invite the audience to come to microphones and ask your questions because we only have 
about 15 more minutes, and then like Cinderella and the coach, we have to go to another form by midday, by, not midnight, but by 12 noon, 12 noon today. So is, does anyone have any questions? There are two mics, one in each aisle. I don't see a rush to the mics. So this is surprising me a little bit. I'm going to give you the time to get to the mic and ask your questions. I will ask something prompted by all of your presentations. What place or role does humor have in your work? Hello? Yeah, humor. At least humor is, um, it's, it's a lot. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. If I, I didn't know if my presentation was funny or not. But, <laughs> but, but um, I, I'm constantly laughing at myself, you know? I cannot take myself too seriously. And it helps me see what I do, you know? I don't know. That's, that's all I can, can, can say. I mean, I, I'm always cracking jokes, but I'm not that funny. Yeah, I think. I just saw. <clears throat> well, I'll say that um, never consciously does does humor have anything to do with it, but it is a kind of a counter. Um, what uh, an important part of life that um, you know that helps be a balanced person. I just saw a, a, a brief video that was made by a Taiwanese. Um, film crew, and they just sent me the. Of, they came to my studio for a couple of weeks, and um, I saw them at other events, and so they sent me the rough draft, 12 minutes. And there was not a single frame where I was smiling. <laughs> they asked if I had any comments. I said, surely, out of like hours and hours and hours of footage, you can find a moment where I'm smiling in the middle of it. So they, um, they obliged me. They had to apparently go deep. But um, <laughs> it's, for me, it's, there's a lot to worry about. And um, I won't say that dominates the, the thinking, um, but uh, I, you know, I love the reprieve of a good laugh when I can get one. <laughs> can I ask you a question? You make two. I saw, do you have two benches? Yeah. Do you always make a sister or, or that when you? I, um, I don't always, but what would often happen, say, especially during the Peter Joseph decade of the 90s, was um, that was the gallery I showed with. I would get a commission for something, and then I would make something on spec at the same time. Um, so the commission would help to finance making another piece. What's more likely to happen is a commission will act as a kind of a springboard for a related piece, but not, um, not the same form. Anybody else with a comment on that? Michael, Cheryl, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say that the thing that I saw in all of our work is we play. We're players. Every well, last one of us. We're, we're set in the stage. We're engaged in what we're doing. And it's, it's humor sometimes, but it's also the fun part of what uh, an artist's life is all about, is being there, being immersed in work, and being surprised by it. And I feel like that that's one of the greatest joys in making, is being surprised by your own work, and then being in love with the work like you've seen today. I mean, it's just, you know, great work is made by these five people. And, and I just feel like they're doing something that, that makes us related and connected because we're all sort of on a similar kind of walk or journey. So I'm going to go to Myra. Do you, did you want to add something? Uh -huh. So we're going to go to the audience now. Let's start with the gentleman over here. Please tell us who you are and ask your question. Good morning. I'm Jerry Paulson. Um, each of you in your own way uh, dealt with the issue of transient versus permanentness, whether it was um, you know, metal objects that melt, Thurman not wanting to keep objects. Um, in some way or another, that, that issue um, came up. How long does a quilt last? It, it, you, you can look at it in many different ways. So I just wonder if, if each of you could perhaps um, expand on that notion of, 
of transientness versus permanentness in your art. You all, it's over to you. Okay. You choose who answers. Well, it's a very interesting question and very complicated as well. I mean, I think that the work that, um, the, the material that I start with is considered so strong, it's uh, endurable, it's um, multi-generational in terms of it's, you know, as an object uh, coming from the crafts or a domestic object, it's intended to be um, passed on through generations. So I think that that's an interesting um, challenge then to play with. And um, also to kind of think about the audience or the, the user or viewer's engagement with a still object in the sense of time. You know, like it's, I think, sort of related to the humor conversation, there's funny and then there's like funny, you know? Um, and like getting people to sort of stop with something is a way to disrupt the flow, right? So like they may be like zooming past and we can temper that experience by creating a moment of something that's flying by, you know? Um, so I think there's, I think another um, thing about time is how damn long it takes to make something, you know? Um, <laughs> and uh, the craft aspect, I mean, I've been working on a piece that I didn't show in the slides because it's been six months and it's still the same, it looks the same every time I see it, but it's not done yet. You know, and um, we are like eager to get ideas out there and then at the same time we have this halt of, wait a minute, there you have to do this before you can do this and then there's this and then there's that. And um, so trying to, to keep pace with ideas and at the same time be disciplined in our approach to executing those ideas is a, a time, you know, engagement that as a maker I'm constantly dealing with. I don't know if that answers or touches on the question, but here you try. <laughs> I think we're kind of answering this pretty free form. Um, I would admit that as a younger artist, uh, how to take care of these things was not uppermost in my mind. I do come from a family of painters, and uh, the idea that I was a quilt maker was kind of like, hmm. And, and I will say now at the age that I am, I ask myself, why in heaven's name didn't I paint instead of make quilts? <laughs> because of the care, you know, that is needed. But that was also behind building the new studio to have proper, a proper place to store the work on the upper floor. Um, I, I would say to all of you that I'm far more careful about every aspect of my work now in terms of how I dye, so that it's a, per a very good dye, it's a more permanent dye. Um, every part of it I'm much, much more careful about. And that is just the way it is. Quilt make, quilts are very much in some ways like watercolors. They just have to be taken care of. Uh, just to that point, I mean, the. The temporal quality of everyday life that we go by, we go by through it. My wife and I walk a lot. From one day to the next, our environment's changing. It's really changing. And we spend a lot of time, like you said, an inordinate amount of time to capture something that we're trying to communicate. And for me, it's sort of trying to talk about that temporal quality in something that's a little more eternal, slightly eternal. And I know that everything will disappear, everything will be gone. But we are trying to capture that moment. And, and I love, for a guy who struggled uh, with language, I love the written word. And I think it's amazing that you can, a book can sit on a shelf for 50 years, and you open it up, and you can be blown away by it. So in the same way, as an artist, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to, someone to come in and see something that I've put something into and be taken somewhere else. And that, that, to me, is a level of success, just to be able to take them somewhere else. Thurman, you want to go first? I, I, um, let me think. I, I've never really, I mean, most of my concerns about how long things actually last has been imposed by, you know, people say, oh, how long, you know, they asked me, the, the, it's been imposed by other institutions or something. I, 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 um, 
I'm, I'm really terrible. I, I take apart my own pieces after they're done and use the parts on other ones. Um, the, one of the first pieces I ever sold was at the Corning Museum. And um, I had never really sold anything. And I had thrown it out. So they called me up and they say they want to buy this thing. And I'm thinking, holy cow, they want to buy this thing for all this money? So I said, send me a picture, because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> So they sent me the picture, and I'm like, okay, do you have any other pictures? So they sent me the pictures, <laughs> and I make a counterfeit. <laughs> I do, that's the truth. I, and I'm like, and then I'm like, well, you know, I told them I, I, I had to change it, you know? So I did, and they, they have it in the museum. And I'm, you know, and I'm, so I, you know, I think that, that it's sort of like, how does it, how does that influence what I make, you know? How does it affect my thinking? How is it a part of my thinking? Why should anything last forever? You know, why should it, you know? Um, so these are the things I think about. I, I love the idea of like work kind of self-destructing after a period of time, just to rethink how long do we live? You know, I'm, I've had to change reds to enamels from paint to enamels. So the, I've done studies where the light hits the glass like the one at the Toledo Museum, there was an analyst that caused that had to determine if you know the UV light hitting the color, how long would it last? And they wanted, I think it was a hundred. Maureen Littleton is here, I think, and she knew she was involved with that project. And I think it was 150 years they wanted the piece a guarantee. I'm like, are you get kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And the, the company that used the silicone, they said we don't test it that long. But we use it in the building, and the building's going to fall on your head, you know? So where does it, where does it end, you know? I think we're going to move to our next questioner, who is right over here. Whoops. Hello, my name is Sharon Grotevant, and I, I just want to thank you all for the profound inspiration and beauty that you're bringing to all of us. It's really emotional for me. But I have a specific question uh, for Michael Hurwitz. Um, you mentioned a process that you do that involves Indian raw silk. And I just happen to have a lot of it kind of lying around. And that's a long, that's a long story. But I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more um, about this process that you do with the raw silk. Well. <laughs> if it's not proprietary. No, not proprietary. Okay. I, um, let's see. I, uh, I started using it because I was looking for a way to cover a compound surface with um, like a, a monochromatic element that wasn't paint. So wood, wood or paper, or rather wood will bend like paper. It'll go this way or this way, but you can't get it to go both ways. Mm. Um, but wet fabric would go both ways. Um, so I just, I, I use West System Epoxy, which is a boat builder's um, epoxy, and I just drench the fabric with that. Where it, um, I, you sort of have to massage it as it's um, curing. You know, if it goes around a corner and there's no way to fasten it. Um, so you just sort of hold it in place while the glue kicks and then um, sand it and apply more finish. And these were uh, the grainer's chair is finished this way. And it looks like micarta, or uh, like an early um, you know, laminate of, of fiber and resin. Thank That's you. It. Yep. I'm told there's one minute left. <laughs> That's just the perfect amount of time for me to wrap things up, in particular by wanting to Thank the staff by name, the James Renwick Alliance staff who made today possible. That's Emily Schimmel, Bridget Galvin, and our extraordinary director, Jamie Ann Amicucci, whose first year it is as director of the JRA. A lot of you in the audience know us, but there are some who's probably it's your first time spending 
a morning and part of your Saturday with the James Renwick Alliance. We are a membership-based organization, so we only grow and benefit and progress by having new people join us as members. There's information about how to join as a member, both in the program and on our website. And oh, by the way, you can also talk to us. We're happy to talk to you and introduce you to other people. Uh, membership is very reasonable and it has some great benefits and it's a one of a kind group in Washington DC. So please explore that as much as you wish and please invite others to, to learn about us. We have, for example, a program a weekend from now um, that will be at American University at the Katzen Museum and Arts Center. We have a lecture, which I think is a boring term. It's an, a happening, it's an experience with an artist on May the 4th. There's more information in the program. Uh, we are a public and open membership organization. So by all means, if you don't know the terminology of craft, that shouldn't stop you from hanging out with us. We have meetups, we have, have uh, up, you get to learn about what's going on at all parts of the spectrum. I would say that's really the essence of the JRA. And with that, I really would just like to thank you all for being here. A lot of choices on this Saturday morning. You've chosen to be with us. We appreciate that. I want to thank all of the deep supporters and patrons of Springcraft Weekend, many of whom are in the audience. And with that, I want to thank you, encourage you to dialogue with us, and enjoy your Saturday afternoon. <laughs>